Hello and welcome to another uh, Green Thumb Lecture Series. My name is John Schaefer and I'm with the Harris County Public Library. Joining me today uh, will be a member of the Harris County Master Gardeners Association uh, for a very special presentation and discussion. Uh, we are here online uh, usually every third Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. and that of course is right now. Uh, today's topic is Growing Roses in Texas. So this is going to be a popular one. Uh, before I introduce our presenter, I just want to go over a couple of things real quick. Uh, first, we love questions. So please, please, please um, uh, ask your questions. And the way you can do that is by typing them into the uh, your Facebook comment section or the YouTube comment section, wherever you are watching this, please go ahead and type your, que your questions in. And along the way, as we are uh, doing our presentation, uh, you might start seeing an answer in your question because we have uh, members of the Harris County Master Gardeners monitoring the chat. And so they will be answering the questions as they come up. And of course, we will pause uh, a couple of times throughout the uh, presentation to uh, ask our presenters some questions as well. Um, and uh, the second thing I want to bring up is that we have one more scheduled show for this year, and that's going to be on October 17th, Trees and Tree Care, which is definitely what you want to get into right before uh, we move into the, the holiday season. So that's on October 17th, uh, Trees and Tree Care. So make sure you uh, click the notification button on the presentation, so on the, uh, the events, so you will be reminded when that comes up. And of course, today we are talking about growing roses in Texas, uh, and that would mean brings us to our presenter, who I would like to introduce, uh, Karen Gerlock, uh, Dr. Gerlock as it is, is a breast imaging radiologist in her spare time. She has been avidly gardening for the in the South for 25 years and has been a master gardener since 2015. Um, she is also a consulting rosarian for the American Rose Society and serves on the Houston Rose Society as the publicity chair and is a a correspondent for gardening articles and publications. She enjoys, if you haven't noticed, she enjoys growing roses, uh, pollinator perennials, herbs, and vegetables. And she also, just on as a side note, uh, maintains about twenty maintains about twenty beehives, uh, chickens, ducks, and and she's had a family too. So, uh, Karen, Dr. Karen, uh, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited for this presentation. How are you today? Good. Thank you for having us. This is actually a complete pleasure to share our joy with Rose about roses. Um, and I also want to thank, um, thank you for recording this and the Harris County Public Library and also Joanne and our master gardeners in the background doing the panelists and, and putting all these resources up for us. Absolutely. They'll be answering questions along the way and watching. So once again, get those questions in the uh, uh, type those in the comment section and we will get to them. Um, all right. Well, you know what? Uh, let's get to it. Uh, I'm very excited, as I know everybody else is, so I will let you take it away all about Texas Rose Gardening. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to introduce you to the Green Thumb Gardening Series. If this is your first time, this is a great resource uh, that is coming from the Harris County Master Gardeners under the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. It is a complete free service, free resources, and just plain great information sharing for you. So, and if you have questions, please put them in a the chat. We're going to stop periodically and ask, answer questions. And we'll also be happy to get back to you. If we don't know the answer, we can find out. Okay, so many of our sources are coming from these main um, organizations. Uh, the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, the sources are very scientifically based. And they actually test things and test gardens all over the state. Um, the Texas Master Gardeners, the Harris County Master Gardeners, and I'm including a lot from the Houston Rose Society and the American Rose Society. And these are also groups that we have, I'm one of the consulting rosarians, where if you have questions or if you are suspicious of a disease, for example, there's a disease called Rose Rosette disease. If you suspect that, you can contact the members to take a look. Okay, so... Basically, as a summary, as a big picture summary, and what I want you to take away is that rose gardening is often has a reputation for being very difficult and very tedious and requires a lot of maintenance and spraying and pruning and whatnot. But really, there's ways to optimize your success, and they include how you place your plants, how you prepare your planting, and what plants you select. We'll also touch upon a couple things such as uh, pruning roses, how to do that, 
and also discuss maybe a little bit about heat stress that we've encountered in all sorts of plants in our garden this summer. And then lastly, I'm going to address what Earthkind and Texas Superstar plants are and how they can help you pick out the best plants for your garden. Okay, so just an over, overview. Um, we are a family um, that we are part of an artist community in the city of Houston. We grow lots of plants, lots of perennials and herbs, roses, um, and we're powered by four kids. Two of them are our own. Those on the two on the right are mine and two of their friends that uh, really love bringing joy to the community and answering questions. So basically my takeaway point from this slide, if these kids in this picture can learn all about gardening and answer your questions and, and have that insight, so can you. It's not that hard. You gotta stick to the principles. And by doing that, you will have wonderful results. Next slide. This is another picture of my daughter holding a goat. Um, we've wanted goats, but we've held off because we fear they will eat the plants. <laughs> okay, so first I'm going to um, also discuss another a little disclaimer. Um, we There are many ways to grow plants and roses. Um, we actually make every attempt to be as, you know, looking at this picture, we try to be as organic as possible. And the reason is that for health reasons for us that we choose and we have animals and chickens and children and we don't want we want to minimize runoff into the environment but again there are different approaches if i don't do that approach you know there are many references um such as the texas a m agri-life extension so if you choose a more conventional approach and the houston rose society also has a bunch of resources if you want to do more conventional fertilizers or approaches um and that being said, we're going to talk about, you know, so you want a rose garden. The number one thing that I encounter in many of my questions is, where do I put my roses? Why are they not succeeding? Number one, you really want to look at the placement when you're doing your planning stages. And I'm not talking about this kind of placement. I call this a plant stand and it drives my partner really nuts, <laughs> but it makes a great plant stand. Um, but essentially, um, there are a lot of um, publications out there that say that there are great roses for shady gardens. Well, you know what? That is going to be problematic because what happens is, in my experience and others' experience, when you have limited sunlight, um, the plants are going to be more stressed. They're going to be more susceptible to diseases such as fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, and then they're gonna be weakened so that you have more insect damage. And that leads to a vicious cycle of having to spray and maintain, and then a failure to thrive of your roses. So when I see articles like this, you know, 18 great roses for shady gardens, this is my response. I would, I would avoid it if at all possible. If you are looking at a place that is part sun, I would look around the surrounding environment. You may have a big tree branch that, like one branch that might be occluding the sun. Perhaps if you trim that branch, you may get a little more sun to your plants and that would help optimize your success. And that being said, you also wanna avoid competition. So when you're planting your roses, um, you wanna look out for trees. Usually roses, and this is from my experience, if you plant them close to the trees, envisioning them growing up, it usually doesn't work out very well because the rose um, uh, roots are gonna be competing with the tree roots for nutrients and for water. You may have limited sun. So that might be something you may wanna be very cautious about and give them space so the roots can spread and you have better nutrition access. Another thing is spacing between roses. A lot of times when we plant any kind of plants, we want that really, really full look where everything looks like it's all filled in. But when you plan your garden, you want to allow for spacing to accommodate the full grown size of that plant. So if that plant's gonna be about four feet tall, you'll wanna give it space on either end so it can have good air circulation and spacing. So location, this can be challenging in the Houston area in particular. So 
this example I'm giving you right now is that this does not show good drainage. You can see the standing water in the background. Um, it has a very clay-like, gumbo-like soil that holds too much water. And roots actually need oxygen. So um, it's not going to get much oxygen. And what you're going to see is you're going to see a failure to thrive. And you're going to eventually see death of your plants. So if you have a place like this, you might want to plant a water garden or something that can tolerate all the standing water and not a rose garden. So how do we combat that? One of my favorite ways to overcome the Houston soil is actually to do raised gardens. And there's a variety of ways of doing this. And one of them, um, the advantages, is that you can control your soil quality by the what you add into the boxes or the raised beds. Um, another thing is you can amend it as needed and you have more control over amendments which help enrich the soil. And that could be things like soil, that could be compost, that might be green sand, or whatever your soil needs. And one thing that's really important is that you do a soil test at the beginning of a planting season. You want to know what you're starting out with. For example, um, if we have a major event, a weather event like Harvey, a lot of people found out that their soil was very nitrogen deficient of, um, or lacking of certain um, nutrients. So that's a great time to do a soil test. And that can be done very inexpensively um, through the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. The master gardeners will have forms when they go to the farmer's market or online of how to do this. And another thing I like to do is that when you do raised beds, let me go here, um, you also have more control over the pH. The ideal pH for roses is between 6 and 6.5. So the pH is actually what we call a logarithmic scale. And basically each point that you go up or down, that is a tenfold difference in what we call the hydrogen ion concentration. Um, and why is this important? Because when you have nutrients in the soil, there is going to be an optimum pH level where the nutrients are either held in the soil and not available to the plants, or um, you know you want to find that perfect spot where you know the plant can absorb the potassium, the nitrogen, the phosphorus. Um, so essentially, you want that special little window, and you can gauge that empirically by using a little pH meter. Um, it's not going to be completely accurate, but it'll give you a ballpark figure of where you are. And again, when you get a soil test, you can assess this and then you can amend and you know when you um, amend it, you're changing it to make it more optimal. And a great example of this is with fertilizing is a two-year-old. You can give a two-year-old all the food in the world you can put like 10 plates in front of the two-year-old, but they're only gonna eat what they need and the rest is gonna go to waste. So really you don't wanna spend you know, money on fertilizers that are not necessary or over fertilizing where it's just gonna run off into you know, our drainage bayou systems. Okay. This is another example of a raised bed. As you can see, um, you, there are logs that are being used and that's used to hold up the material in the soil that's in the bed. And this is really cool because the sides will naturally, those logs will decompose after time and they will add to the nutrient content of your bed. We do a lot of this because we have a very woody area and sometimes you know, we have a tree that gets struck by lightning or um, if it falls in a storm, we will take the logs and put them in small pieces and use them to support our raised beds. And that way we keep it out of the landfill and we are reusing the nutrients, which is a very permaculture base of, you know, enriching your soil like the forest floor. We keep adding nutrients naturally. So another option to do is container gardening. Um, the Houston Rose Society had a great lecture last week on growing roses in containers, and that is a great option. Um, if you live in an apartment, you don't have much space, or you want to move the plants when the sun patterns change throughout the year, container gardening is great. However, it will require more watering, for example, this past summer. 
If you grow plants in containers, you may have to water every day and sometimes multiple times a day. And that's when you want to consider maybe putting in an irrigation system because it's really hard to remember to do that each and every day or multiple times a day. And also the materials. What kind of pot you're going to use does matter. For example, if you use a terracotta pot, um, the, the unglazed terracotta pots, um, they will dry out much more rapidly. So you're going to be watering a lot more and that's a lot more work. So you may want to save your terracotta plants for things like succulents that you want to stay in the dry side. And you may want to opt for things like a plastic or a ceramic glazed container for your roses that will hold in the moisture a little longer. Okay, and again, Real quick, good doctor. Absolutely. Uh, jumping, got a question for you. Uh, this came in. So um, you mentioned goats <laughs> earlier, and you guys have ever think about goats. Um, now, goats, obviously, we, we could eat roses, but are there any other animals that you need to be worried about, like your pets or, you know, raccoons or armadillos that might be going after roses? Is, is that a fear or a worry? You know what? My approach is that everything balances each other out. You know, sometimes we get some. Um, wasps that will actually cut out the petals um, out of the roses and when it's in a bud and then when it blooms it's actually really cool because you have this very symmetric pattern around the rose i have a few pictures of it okay. you know that happens but you know what you think about the beneficial wasps they may need a home but you know what they also lay their eggs on for example the um the horned um, tomato worms that will eventually cannibalize the or you know eat the tomato worms so everything is a symbiotic relationship. We don't see too many armadillos here. Um, our biggest one are squirrels going after our vegetables. Um, but, you know, I, I have a 16 year old who has a slingshot. I'm kidding. Okay. But, um, but we have, you know, we have dogs that chase off the squirrels, but really there's enough for everybody. So oh, okay. I, just, I just plant more for everybody. But pets is a great example because there are certain plants that are toxic to pets. And those tend to be like the um, trumpet um, flowers. Um, there are certain flowers that can be toxic to children or to pets. And I find that our chickens and dogs stay away from them, but some pets may not follow those rules, you know? So you, <laughs> you really wanna be careful if you have house plants and cats that eat them and just be judicious about what you pick out. But actually toxicity wise, roses are not um, in that toxicity range because you can actually, if you don't spray, you can actually use rose hips and make rose hip teas or jellies. So, um, you know, or you can, you know, it's a very edible type of plant. I would not eat the thorns so. though. Gotcha, yeah. Well, let's hope my dogs uh, will you know, save some for me to eat when the time comes, so. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll let you get back into it. I'll, I'll let you know if you have no more questions. <laughs> Absolutely. So I want to bring your attention to the Houston Rose Society. There are free monthly meetings on various topics. It is in person in the Heights and also um, on go-to meetings. So these are the second Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. And it's completely free and a complete service. And then there is a member online archive for if you want to learn more about um, roses from the speakers. And next slide. Selection. Okay, this is a great book. Um, this is a book that comes out as a little pamphlet. It comes out every year through the American Rose Society. And basically, it lists all the different recognized roses. Um, and it's the Bible of what category they belong into. So there's a whole classification system, which is based on their um, genetics, um, their lineage, and their plant growing characteristics. And things that it lists will be the zone, the size of the plants. Is it a repeat bloomer? Um, what is its habit? What is, is its shape or its growth form? And different varieties like bourbon roses. Um, bourbon roses is a rose variety that is grown. There's a heavy population in the Louis Armstrong Park in New Orleans. And they do very, very well in our heat, in our climate. Additionally, I found that the roses <clears throat> of Bermuda which do very, very well in our climate also. So you can find different varieties through this book. And if you want to show off your blooms in one of the rose competitions, this will help you figure out what class it goes into. Okay, I'm gonna, next slide. 
And of course, I love fragrant roses. So in the past, um, the old garden roses, which were, you know, 1860s and older, those tend to be very heavily scented and it's a pleasure to grow them and you can smell them throughout your garden on a summer day or evening. And um, however, with the hybridization process, a lot of effort has gone into the appearance of the blooms and the other characteristics and not necessarily the fragrance. However, there are several hybridizers that are actually bringing back the fragrance to these roses. You know, one of them is Ping Lim, who is using disease resistance, like, um, like the gentleman who did the knockout roses, but he's also working at adding in the fragrance. So that's something to judge when you're selecting what kind of roses you want to grow at your home. Okay, now this is a very long list and this is available at the Houston Rose Society um, online. So you don't have to memorize it. This is just a general overview to show how they are classified. Um, so we have species roses, which are the old ancestors. And then we have the old garden roses before 1867. Those are the ones that have a lot of fragrance and they have so many different characteristics. You have Alba, um, you have bourbon roses, lots of different ones to choose from. And here's some more varieties of old roses. Uh, the China roses, um, those are very repeat bloomers. They do very well. Um, moss roses, mosettes, Portland, and tea roses. So these are all different examples of old garden roses. Again, it's best based on the historical developments and their characteristics of the plants. And these are generalizations. So you got to look at the different varieties in each class and find out the one that's going to work for you. And then we get into modern roses. So these are the ones we see more often in landscapes and in developments and whatnot. So these started with La France basically in 1867. And we have thousands and thousands of varieties. And you can see the hybrid teas, the floribundas, which are used in the landscapes. Okay. And then we have miniature roses, shrub roses, um, climbers, lots of really great options. So that gets me into the habits, the habit of the plants. So when you're planting these rows, you have to plan where you want it to grow and will its shape and form and size fit for your space. You know, I have one rose, it's called a mermaid rose. It's a beautiful white, pink, pale, yellow rose and it's climbing along a fence and it is better than anyone's barbed wire fence that they can install. It is pretty vicious. I'm afraid to walk by it. <laughs> But it blooms beautifully, it's scented, it's a great one, and it gets very dramatic. And if you look at this trellis, you can see that this is from Mary Fulgham's garden. She is actually one of um, the consulting or master rosarians. And she, you can see how she's training the rose to grow up on the trellis. And if you want to optimize flowering along, say, a fence line, you can actually help the roses grow more, um, the branches to train them more horizontally. And that'll result in increased blooming along the um, branches. <clears throat> so this is another example um, of the habit of a plant. You can see all these white roses, how they're grouped together. You see how they're appropriately spaced so it maximizes the air circulation and you're not stifling its full potential. And also, at a design note, I know some people like to put one rose here, pink one here, red one here, and a white one here, and one of everything in one place. But if you're aiming for a more dramatic effect of your design landscape, you may want to group one color together. As you see, all these white roses kind of create a greater impact, and then you have a series of red roses in the background. So that's something you can keep in mind if you're doing a whole rose garden or different areas, you can actually group all the pinks in one place, the reds in one place, the whites in the other place, and you can get more of a grand effect. This is another example. You can see that these pink roses, it just gives you the wow factor. So this actually is something that you think about during your planning stages. So do we have any questions about the planning portion? 
Uh, well, yeah, we do as well. Well, first off, we got a great comment in from Steph, and I think you talked about this a little bit. She says her roses are burning up right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I know our, this summer has been unusually warm, uh, a little more than normal. Is there anything maybe you should do specifically to like try and uh, save the roses that you have if, if they're burning up? So this is this is was a topic that was discussed at one of the recent rose meetings. Um, everybody's encountering this. It is very. Um, it's been a hot summer. It's been brutal. The key is the plants physiologically. I'll touch on this later, but they are in a physiological survival mode. The temperature difference between ninety degree temperature and over hundred degree temperature is vastly different, and the physiological processes in the plant cells are very different. So, when you're above hundred degrees, you are just in survival mode. You want to keep as many of the green leaves as possible, and you want to water. You want to water deeply, and not as frequently, but deeply. You want to get down there and encourage those roots to grow deeper where there's more moisture. And that'll help it survive harsh summers and harsh winters. So those are my biggest tips. Okay. Um, I would be careful of fertilizing and not over fertilize. Sometimes the fertilizers in the ground, the granulars, they're not as well absorbed by the roots when it's really hot like that. So okay. sometimes doing a very light, a very gentle foliar spray will help the plants. Um, like fish oil or um, a seaweed emulsion, you know, make sure you dilute it, make sure you follow the label. I sometimes even go a little lighter than what the label says. Okay. Um, and you want to spray, if you do spray, do it in the evenings when you have less pollinators present and it's not going to scorch the leaves as much because you don't, and you don't want to mix products, only use one. Don't mix things. Don't make a concoction because it <laughs> may be for somebody else but it may completely destroy all your plants. Okay. Um, so sometimes what happens is the leaves on the plants underneath the bottom, they have these things called stomata. When it's less than 90 degrees, they open up. They're like little pores and they can actually absorb nutrition through these pores overnight, for example. And um, while it may not be as efficient absorbing through the roots, you can actually give nutrition through the leaves. But again, you don't want to burn your plants. It's better to go lightly than heavy when we have those extreme temperatures. Now that it's cooling off, these are a couple of things you can do. We're getting down to the 90s and we'll be soon in the 80s. You can do a light pruning. It's more of a haircut. Um, the Rosarians are doing it in anticipation of an upcoming convention and rose show at end of October. So you can do a light pruning of what looks dead. If there's damaged stems, if there's a canker or a sore, you know, you can cut that off so it doesn't cause a portal of entry for bacteria. Um, I would not do extreme pruning. This is not your February pruning. This is a light haircut pruning. So those are things you can do now that it's cooling off. No, that's good. That that helps out a lot. And one other question came in. Um, so, you know, you're talking about all the hybrid roses and the modern roses. Is there a way, if you're interested, to find some of the original roses or the i guess would they be the 1867 roses where would you where would you find those okay uh find them as far as a reference book to purchase, well, to purchase. i mean if you were purchase. somebody wanted to have those so the best way to do that is um there are a number of um nurseries in town that sometimes have old roses and they'll have like things like um uh, the, the earth kind roses um there is the antique rose emporium up in brennan which is they're wonderful folks um, you can get them online. Again, each each retailer will be different, you know, as far as trust, trustworthiness and how they grow it. Um, and you know what? You can actually reach out to the Houston Rose Society. Um, we, there you, go. you know, we've got a lot of resources, a lot of resources and a lot of people who if they've seen something recently, they'll share that. Um, or there's a Facebook page. You can actually ask them, you know, wow. if they, do you know so lots of resources out there. Just there's so uh, many. There's so many. And it really, um, you know, picking out the types. I like that little handbook by the American Rose Society because it gives you the list and the characteristics. Mm -hmm. And you can look up the pictures and see what works for you. You may say, I want something five feet tall. I want it fragrant and I want it to be a repeat bloomer. And you can pick three or five of them, three, four, five of them and look those up. So it's, it's, like a, it's like a dating app except for roses. 
Got it. <laughs> it's the best dating app out there is all I can say. All right. Well, we'll let you get back into it. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen. Nope. Anytime. Anytime. So next slide, fertilizing. We touched upon this about unfertilizing. So this is my grandmother who, she's from Poland, and her philosophy was, I put out the kitchen scraps so that the animals come and their excrement helps feed my garden. So, you know, it's pretty on target because all that stuff is in all our organic, you know, kind of fertilizers that we buy in the store. So anyway, um, we try to keep things very simple and use what we have. We do not put out leaves or other debris or twigs out for collection. We reuse them in our garden to add nitrogen to our flower beds. So that being said, fertilizing, you have two approaches. You could do a conventional approach, which is considered non-organic, or you could do organic. And again, that's going to be dictated by your preferences, your philosophies, and many people have had success with both. Um, but of course, before you do any kind of fertilizing, start with a soil test. Find out what you have before you spend a bunch of money adding stuff that might not be needed or that actually might be detrimental to your garden. So that being said, pruning. How do I prune? This is actually considered a voodoo to many people, and it's a big old mystery. And it's actually quite simple. In fact, um, there is usually a February um, Rose Society pruning demonstration, which is live and in person, where we take different types of rose varieties, and we'll show you how to prune them uh, properly. Um, and it's very hands-on. You make a home with a rose, which is really, really great. And I'm going to discuss about the why, the timing, how do we do it? What to watch out for? Um, do you spray after pruning? Some do, some don't. And what do you do with all the clippings? Because you really don't like to compost them. Um, what happens is over the years, um, you have a lot of fungal diseases, black spots, and spores that are residing on the old leaves. So when you're pruning, you're taking all that off. You don't want to be adding all that back to your compost and into your garden. So I actually do not compost rose clippings or, for that matter, tomato plants or pepper plants for that reason. So why do we do it? So basically, we are trying to remove any kind of disease growth, and we're trying to stimulate new growth. And essentially, um, there are several times we prune. The big time we do our most severe pruning will be around Valentine's Day, about uh, traditionally. And it's going to be pretty severe, but the rose comes back stronger than ever. This time of the year, you can do a light um, haircut if you need it for any kind of dead branches. If you have a branch that's growing into a walkway or a driveway, that's a good time to prune it and give it a light haircut just to keep things under control. Um, and also, if you're doing a rose show, now is a great time for the late October rose show. You actually time your pruning before an event. If you're having a wedding on site, you may want to time your pruning roughly about 40 days before the events, and that will help stimulate new blooms to occur right around that time. Okay, this is an example of a rose show. And essentially, you know, um, this is very planned where you plan your pruning to stimulate new growth, new leaves that are free of disease just prior to the show. Okay, and these are some arrangements at one of the shows that were recently occurred. And essentially, when you plan your pruning, you don't want to prune too late. I do not prune in October, November, December. I just don't because those terminal branches will help protect the rest of the plant during a deep freeze. And you don't want to do it too early. So I will not prune in January. You know, I'm going to wait till middle of February when things are warming up. Okay. Any questions about pruning at all? So far, it looks like we're good on the pruning, um, uh, but I definitely, um, I, I like the picture of the snow, <laughs> the icicles right there. That's uh, maybe one day <laughs> it can cool off. <laughs> it's, 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 that's harsh. The icicles are harsh because when it gets too heavy, they can break the branches of the plants. So we did have one question. If I could yes. back up just a little bit. Sure. Um, Going back to your, your raised beds and talking about like, is there a certain height that you want to have the raised beds outside? And also, do you recommend having like a, a cardboard cover between the ground and the soil that you put on there? Or is it okay if it 
is if you just put the soil like right on, you know, whatever, you know, guard, you know, potting soil you put on there? It depends. It depends on what you're starting out with. If you have a lot of weed or nut sedge and whatnot, yes, I do do cardboard and I do a layer of a couple layers of cardboard or even like multiple newspaper layers to help smother the weeds. That's where that is going at. You're smothering the leaves mm-hmm. or the, 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 the weeds and um, any kind of, um, you know, you're just basically trying to suppress that. And then you add your soil and then you add your plants. Right. Um, my height, like for example, if I were to use cinder blocks, I do about two cinder blocks high. Generally I do about 18 inches. Okay. And the, and the reason for that is if we have a big Harvey event, the root, roots are kind of raised above ground level so that if we have massive rainstorms and flooding, that water can flow out. The roots are not going to be, hopefully not be sitting in water and it's going to drain better. And that being said, I would still mulch. I, I love using like pine straw mulch. I use chopped up leaves that I used to chop up from, you know, with a lawnmower. Right. Um, anything you have that could be used as mulch material will help with that. Uh, first, it'll cool the soil underneath, and it'll help suppress um, any kind of uh, weed weeds growth, and it'll make it easier to pull out any weeds that do grow in there. So those are all the benefits of mulch, and it adds nutrients when it breaks down. Got it. All right. Well, we'll let you get back into it. We'll jump. I'll, I'll interrupt right. you if we have any more. <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. Uh, so this is a, a diagram of essentially. Um, a rose before you prune it and after you prune it. So the big, big thing I want to emphasize is when I'm pruning my roses, any branch that is smaller diameter of than a pencil, it's going to be chopped off. And if you look at that, see all these small things, they're all being chopped off. Anything smaller than a, the width of a pencil. And then you're going to go back to your main canes here and you're going to have not many leaves left or virtually none. So you're going to move all that diseased leaves from last year. And this will be your February pruning, not your August pruning or September pruning. Please do not do this right now. And essentially, if you look at this, they cleaned up a lot of the branches that are in the middle. And what that's going to allow for is better air circulation. And they're picking the branches that make it up more of a fuller outward form. So you're selectively... um, you know, picking which branches and what direction you want your plant to grow and fill into. Um, and there's a big deal. People make about the cuts. Do you put this angle or this angle? And really, you're doing the angle where when it rains, the water is going to kind of, here's a bud, here's a stem, and the water is going to flow away. So that's the only science behind the, uh, the direction of the stem cuts. So I don't worry about that too much. Um, but again, you know, we'll have our demonstrations. When you do prune, you want to look for any um, damage in the stems. In this example, you see a canker and damage to the stem. Stuff like this needs to be cut off. And if I were to cut this off, I would pick that new shoot that's coming off here. I would cut it like right between this new shoot and this diseased wood. And the reason you want to cut that off is any kind of canker or defect in the stem, that is a portal of entry for any kind of fungus or bacteria. And that will can cause actually a whole shrub eventually to demise if you get a bad infection like that. So what do we do with all this stuff? Well, Real the, quick before uh, you yes, leave go for it. Uh, uh, Kathleen uh, had a great question coming in from uh, Facebook. Want to know about? She says she's been told uh, not to prune her antique roses. Is this true? Well, it depends what kind, really, um, because what happens is a lot of the climbing roses, you don't want to prune them too severely because basically some of them bloom on the older stems. So if it's a one-time bloomer, you would wait till that bloom cycle ends, and then you can prune afterwards. So that's exactly one of the benefits of knowing. I do have antique roses, a lot of them, and I do, um, I do tend to select the ones that are repeat bloomers. And I will do a light pruning if it's in the way or if it's diseased or just kind of keep it in shape and help it grow back fuller. So it really depends. I think maybe it might be a reference to some of the climbers. Okay. You, you want to wait till they bloom because if you cut them before they bloom, you'll never get a bloom that year. You know, when, when you say repeat bloomers, do you mean like how, like what, what time of the, I mean. Uh... So basically some roses um, are 
going to be one-time bloomers. There's some phenomenal ones, um, like the Katrina Rose. Um, that one actually blooms. It gives this big flush in the spring, early okay. spring. And that's when I know spring is here because, I mean, it is beautiful. It's a gorgeous array, a huge flush of blooms. And then it may have some sporadic, you know, intermittent blooms once in a while. But largely, it's going to be that spring bloom that's really dramatic. So if I were going to prune that one, I would wait until after that bloom cycle. I wouldn't do it before because then you won't have any blooms, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. So what do we do with the rose clippings? So actually, um, I remember it was really interesting. We had the folks at the Houston Zoo come by and they were actually picking up the rose clippings and feeding them to the elephants. So nothing, nothing goes unwasted. Okay. Um, so spring, what do you do after you are pruning? So, so a lot of people will do some spring and they'll use, they'll spray antifungals or um, neem oil or something to protect and prevent uh, fungal diseases. So number one, when you are spraying, um, there's a couple of guidelines that you want to keep in mind. Um, I'm sorry, my husband's making an espresso. I don't think he realizes I'm presenting here. <laughs> um, so you want to keep in mind the um, the safety of what you're spraying. You know, you want to keep in mind the timing. You don't want to spray things when all the pollinators are flying around. You want to wait till the evening when they go to sleep and they're not um, on the plants. You can refer to the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension or the Houston Rose Society um, for different spraying regimens for different diseases, if it's for fungicides or if it's for thrips or for aphids. Um, and they'll have some really great recommendations. And above all, I want you to remember that the label is the law. So you can't go out and buy a commercial product and use it in your household because that would be breaking the law. And any kind of safety concerns, um, you really want to address that and have the appropriate safety protection to protect yourself and your loved ones. And this is one of the slides that just demonstrates the reason that we like to be as little spray, low spray, no spray as possible. As you said earlier, um, we keep about 20 beehives and we like to minimize any kind of spraying. And we also keep chickens and ducks. Okay. Um, the next topic I am going to discuss is that heat stress. We've had a lot of heat stress this summer. We've seen it in our flower beds and our plants in the pots. And as I said earlier, your plant is in survival mode. The physiological process of the cells is very different between 90 degrees and over 100 degrees. So your goal is to help that plant stay alive until things cool down, which is occurring right now. You want to water deeply, um, not as frequently, but definitely deeply. You want to get encourage those roots to grow downward. And that holds true in the spring, summer, and the fall. You want a really good, deep root system. Um, new plantings and potted plants, you're going to have to water them more often. On the flip side, you don't want to overwater because you can drown your plants. And you want to be very cautious with fertilizers and realize that during the summer, our plants are not in their full active growth stage. So, you know, it's not going to be using all that fertilizer that you give it and it's going to be wasted. So I would go a little easier on the fertilizer, maybe do foliar spray if needed. Um, and also, you know, consider doing a soil test or a pH test because a lot of watering very frequently, especially in pots, um, will cause leaching of nutrients and um, different salt buildups. So now's a great chance to do a soil test. Okay, so bronzing. This is another disease that has arisen um, on roses that people have noticed. So this is a form of heat stress that is currently being researched and it occurs in many different rose varieties. So if you see this, definitely reach out to your extension agent um, or to Texas A&M. It's, it's, um, it's currently not really known why this happens. It may be due to the heat, pesticides, 
or nutritional differences, but this is an active area of research. Okay. And this is at, where do you go to look at demonstration roses? Because I love getting inspiration about what to do in my garden. And I love visiting what, and seeing what other people have done. So there are a number of different um, regional gardens that you can look at. This one is going to be at the American Rose Society um, American Garden in Shreveport, Louisiana. So if you're ever going through Shreveport, this is a great place to go and look at different rose cultivars. Another great demonstration garden is the, um, the Antique Rose Emporium up in Brennan. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but we actually have a demonstration garden for the Master Gardeners, which is going to be down in Pasadena at the Genoa Friendship Gardens. And there are, um, there's a, a great variety of demonstration roses. You can see, you can ask questions. The Master Gardeners are there in the open garden days. They'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay. Do you have any other questions at all regarding growing roses? Yes, uh, we did have a couple of questions come in. Um, so let's say you've uh, you've done the research. You know you uh, you want to have you already you know got some great spots in your yard for some roses. You're gonna get the raised flower bed. When is the best time of year to get those roses in the ground? So you have to think about the temperature here in Houston. So number one, it depends what kind of roses you're doing. Also, if you are doing bare root roses. Um, where it's basically you have just these stems coming out of a bag and then it comes down, you have a root with some um, pine bark around it and it's wrapped in a bag. Those are best done as early in the year as possible. I would say um, February is a great time to put your bare root roses into the okay. ground. Um, and next, uh, roses that are in pots, you have a lot more flexibility. You can actually put them in throughout the year I would avoid 100 degree weather because we're going to be doing a lot of water and it's going to be a big struggle. You should avoid everything in 100 degree weather. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, you can, you can, there are some things that will work well, but, okay. um, but it, roses, I would not do roses in 100 right. degree weather. Um, so, what I would do is um, I would go ahead and do those preferably in the spring so I don't have to water as frequently or actually in the fall too. So these are, we're entering a prime rose planting time where it allows it enough time to get established mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, in time for the winter time. And then you'll have a more stronger plant, a more established root system in the spring. Got it. And you mentioned bronzing, which is, uh, that's, that's scary to see that that's something that's going on now. If you, if you happen to see those on your roses now, where, how would you, you take pictures with your phone or how do you, where, where do you recommend sending, how can we help out with that? Um, we're going to have some information at the end to, okay. with the email for the Texas Master Gardeners or Harris County Master Gardeners. And you can send us any questions or pictures. Um, Perfect. All right. Excuse me a minute. Stephen, can you wait one second, please? <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> I can hear that in the background. I, I kind of want an espresso now. So if you could have him make another one, that would be great. But uh. <laughs> Steven, can you make another espresso? <laughs> yes, it's okay. I'll, let you, I'll let you get back to it. Okay. All right. I'm going to get back to, um, now that we can all have our espressos, um, I'm going to discuss Earth Kind Roses. So um, Earth Kind Roses is an effort by the Texas AgriLife Extension. So basically, the extension has um, selected and tested a variety of roses to see which ones do the best in our climate, in our clay soil, and show the best uh, pest tolerance, you know, and that we can grow anywhere in the States. So this is a great resources. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Again, this is, um, the examples I give are going to be a little overwhelming, but you can look this up online. And this is a great way to find roses that are easy, that work really well. And I'll tell you the ones I have. So essentially we do field trials and we see which ones perform the best and the ones that perform the best in a variety of soils because the soil in Houston is going to be a little different than say East and West Texas or Northern Texas. So these are just really great suggestions for our states. So benefits, why is this good? First of all, you're going to enjoy wonderful flowering plants. You're not going to have to use as much fertilizers, pesticides, and water resources. 
And that's really great because we've seen our water bills in the past summer. We really want to minimize using our resources. And, and I'll be honest, a lot of these varieties I have, I rarely water and they've, I mean, I have some that are about 10 feet tall now. It's pretty, pretty impressive. So this is going to be one example. This is all on the Texas a and Life Extension website. So this is going to be called, well, pink. So this is actually a rose um, that does very well. It's suspected to be uh, pink pets, you know, and it is, you can see the details here. It's a found rose, which basically means that we don't know where it came from. Um, there's a group in Texas called the Texas Rose Rustlers. They go around the state digging in cemeteries, you know, old abandoned lots, and they're discovering um, rose varieties that we never knew existed. And they don't dig them up. They're very respectful. They will propagate them respectfully or ask permission to if needed and continue keeping them alive and keeping them hopefully in commerce so we can enjoy them and they don't fade away and go away forever. So here you can see, you can see the size. It gives you the height, width, spacing, the color, the blooms. Is it fragrant? If you want a fragrant rose, this one probably might not be for you, but it's very hardy. Um, and it also gives you your cold hardiness because in Houston, we really don't cover our roses for freezes. And you can see that this is one that would do very, very well here. Okay. So next variety I'm going to give you is Cecile Bruner. This is another example of a rose that is an earth kind rose. And again, it's cold hardy to our region. It ha does have some fragrance and you can plan how big it's gonna be for your space. So this is a very easy, very hardy rose variety that's on the list. This is actually one of my favorite ones. So white roses can be difficult to grow. And the reason is they can be very susceptible to chili thrips, which is an insect that will infect the, um, the blooms and it will cause failure for the flower to open. And there's ways to treat that and prevent it. But uh, Duché is a great rose. It has performed outstanding for me in the Houston area. It is a repeat bloomer. It is fragrant and meaning it blooms all the time throughout the spring, summer, fall, until it freezes. And I have a few, you know, ones that only bloom once. But for me, I like the, re and a lot of people like the repeat bloomers because you get to just enjoy it a lot longer. So next slide. Uh, uh, Duchess this is a great one. It's a very pendulant, larger peach rose. It's very fragrant. Fragrant. It's a repeat bloomer. Mine gets to be about six feet tall. And this is always in bloom. This one has been in bloom all summer long, and it's such an easy one to grow. Now, when you're looking at the sizes of roses, I do want to caution you that when you go to a nursery and you see a tag, and it says it's going to grow to be about six feet tall, um, there's a methodology they use to get those numbers. Um, they don't just make them up. These plants are tested in test gardens throughout the country, which could be in California, it could be in Chicago, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And what they do is they compile the information of how big it gets, how tall, how wide, and they average it. So when you're planting your garden in the Houston area, we have a much longer growing season than, say, Pennsylvania. So you can expect that that plant, even though it says it might be only four feet tall, it may actually get a little bigger than what that tag is telling you. So you want to plan that when you're doing your garden, okay? This is actually one of my funnest roses that I really love. It is another constant bloomer throughout the heat, uh, Metabolus. Um, it loves to change colors. It's a very multicolor. It has pink and yellows and oranges and peaches in the blooms. And it is a repeat bloomer. And it's actually um, named as the butterfly rose because the blossoms look like butterflies that have landed on the bush. I mean, some say that, but it's just a really fun rose that just does really wonderfully here. And you can see it's not fragrant, but it's just a fun, beautiful, blooming rose. Okay. So those are some great examples. If, um, those are all great examples if you're going to pick your first rose. 
and you want to plant it and try it out in a sunny place and with all the tips that we've given you. Um, I'm also going to call your attention that um, there is going to be a convention. It's going to be the Southern Rose District Convention in the end of October. And what I really like about this convention, it's going to be a rose show, but there's going to be people there to answer all your questions. And it's going to be right in Bel Air. Um, there's going to be a great category in this rose show. It is going to be the quote, I forgot the name of this rose or I lost a tag of this rose show competition category. So if you have a rose that you do not know what, what variety it is, you can actually take a cutting and enter it and you will have people help you find out what variety it is. So it's another great excuse to go. And I also want to bring your attention that we are winding down the Green Thumb Gardening Series for 2023, and there will be a new schedule for 2024 soon. So we have one more next month on tree planting and uh, tree growing, and that's going to be really important, especially after the heat of the summer. I think we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of long-term effects on our tree health. So that should be a great talk to go to. There's another great workshop on ethnic vegetables on October 7th. Um, our climate in Houston allows us to grow a lot of variety of plants, um, and it, it's pretty amazing um, a lot of different vegetable varieties we can do. So if you can make it, that's a great one to go to. And then next weekend, we are going to have a plant sale on the west side. So come on out. Um, these are varieties of plants that the master gardeners have picked out to specifically succeed in growing in our area. So. Um, you know, you can look online and get an idea what's going to be there and come on out. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Any more questions you can think of? Yeah, we do. We had a couple of come in. Uh, so uh, you mentioned it. I want to go over this too. The Texas Rose Wranglers. Is that Rustlers. The, Rustlers. Texas, Texas Rose Rustlers. Yes. Texas Rose Rustlers. Now, um, when you say digging in cemeteries, you mean like just like the no, 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 no. They're not digging digging in cemeteries. <laughs> They're basically what they do is they scour um, a lot of old places, and you'll be amazed at what plants. You know, like um, like one of the salvia varieties, um, Henry Julberg salvia, mm -hmm. and then the Augusta Julberg salvia. These are two salvias that are on a super. Actually, the Henry Juling is on the superstar list of the Texas A and M. These were found on a. Um, at an old grave site that was unirrigated. And one was found on the grave of Henry Dueling, and the other one was found on the grave of Augusta Dueling. And what happened was those survived were hardy and thrived upon, with neglect, which I love those kind of plants. So what they do is they do clippings and they propagate the plants. They're not going to destroy or dig up the original plants because that would be very disrespectful, especially in a cemetery, right? right. But... What happens is we are keeping those plants in um, in commerce, you know, where they are available for future generations. Oh, and if great. and if they survive under those conditions for a hundred years, I'm hoping they're going to survive in my garden. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, me too, me too. Uh, let's see, we had a question come in here. Another one, um, this one from Kathleen as well. My grandmother had a beautiful little rose bush. That had a delicate little that had delicate little stems. It looked like uh, the little rose soaps, and it never opened more than that. Uh, I cannot find any information on it. She lived in Alvin, Texas, and this is where the small rose bush was. Is there a place I can go to research and find this little rose bush? That is really a great question because actually, when I um, talked about that uh, convention, that category, mm -hmm. you can enter exactly those type of roses that you are just wondering what kind is this? And you're going to have a plethora of folks who are total experts and will help steer you at least to the right classification that you can narrow down the choices. If not, identify it down to the variety. So that's going to be the funnest category because right. I mean, my chickens and dogs have completely lost so many tags. I'm going to bring a few myself, right? Um, <laughs> And actually, but if you can't make it or if you're out of town, you can take a picture and you can send it to the Houston Rose Society and ask, you know, that's yeah. why, you know, we're, what we're there for. And we work on various projects with a and Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So hopefully, uh, Kathleen, you can make that to the uh, the event coming up in October. And, uh, you know, one last question. You mentioned so many great roses that, you know, are your favorites. And there's obviously... Is there any rose you recommend people avoid by any chance? Is there like a one that's just going to be disappointment or anything? 
Well, you know, there's this age old debate about grafted versus own root roses. I am very, I have not, I've really struggled with some grafted roses and some people have had success with it. I don't even bother anymore personally, but, um, and I got into an argument or a discussion, I'm sorry, a debate with, um, one of uh, the gentlemen from California who came to discuss and said, oh, yes, grafted roses are much, much better than own roots. Um, we had a differing opinion, but but it could be that it could be my style. You know, it could be that I'm not going to spray things that require a lot of maintenance. Um, but I like own root roses because if you do have a hard freeze, like, for example, or what we had last time, I've had more luck with own root roses if they look like they're dead suddenly I see a little branch coming up where the whole plant comes back from a little branch and you're not going to get that with the grafted roses, you know? So that's why I prefer own roots. Well, there you go. Listen, thank This has been an amazing experience, an amazing presentation. Dr. Karen, thank you so, so much for your time. Um, this of course will be living on, on the internet so we can direct people to it. And I know that we'll, if you have any questions as uh, if you watch this at a later date, just send those to the Harris County Master Gardeners. And I know they will uh, uh, They will love to uh, try and uh, answer those for you. So thank you so much. And I hope that we can see you next year sometime. That would be wonderful. And I, I'm looking forward to even just attending the lectures. I think thank you so much, John, for making this a resource for all of us because um, sharing information is what the Master Gardeners are all about. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And just as you can see on the bottom of the screen there, I want to remind everyone, remind everybody one more time, October 17th at 11 a.m. We'll be talking about trees and tree care. And then uh, we'll have the schedule coming up for next year, 2024. And uh, there's always going to be new stuff coming in from the Master Garden. So please check out their website as well. Dr. Karen, thank you so much. Have everybody uh, have a great rest of your day and enjoy that espresso. OK, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.